Hello, and um, thanks very much for joining us for this event on the place of play within our school system. I'm Dominic Wise, Professor in Early Childhood and Primary Education, and I'm really pleased to be your chair this evening. This topic is obviously close to my research interests uh, in terms of the role of play in children's vital early development. But play is, of course, important throughout the life course and as is increasingly recognised even in the workplace. It has a more complicated relationship with our education system and, and that's what we're here to examine this evening. In terms of how the event will run, uh, once I've introduced our panellists, we'll take a brief opening statement from each of them. But we want the debate, as usual, to be as interactive as possible. So please do use the chat function on Slido to share your views on what you're hearing and also post questions for me to ask the speakers. You can also tweet about the event using the hashtag IOEDebates. So to help us review why play is important and what needs to be done for that to be better recognised in our school system, our speakers are Dr. Sarah Baker, who's a reader in developmental psychology and education at the University of Cambridge. So as part of the Centre for Research on Play in Education, Development and Learning, and her research looks at how best to support children's agency over their own learning, including by using playful approaches. Sarah's work also addresses the next step, how research, in this case from cognitive science, can be translated into educational contexts. Tom McBride is Director of Evidence at the Early Intervention Foundation. Tom joined EIF from the Department for Education, where he provided analytical support across many areas, including the educational performance of disadvantaged children and social mobility. Prior to that, he worked at the National Audit Office, designing evaluations across a range of government activity. So Tom has lots to say about making the case for play via robust evidence. Michael Rosen is Professor of Children's Literature at Goldsmiths and one of Britain's best love writers and performance poets for children and adults. Michael's regular media contributions include his monthly open letter to the Secretary of State for Education in The Guardian, where he critiques government schools policy from the standpoint of a parent. Among Michael's 200 plus publications are The Sad Book with Quentin Blake, and of course, We're Going on a Bear Hunt with Helen Oxenbury. And Shanila Saeed is Head of Education and Programme Director of Digital Schoolhouse at the Association for UK Interactive Entertainment, that's UKIE. A former teacher and Head of Department, Shanila has over 20 years experience of computing education. She joined UKIE in 2014 and among her publications is Hacking the Curriculum, Creative Computing and the Power of Play which uses play-based learning to teach computing. So our speakers will give their uh, five minute presentations in the order I've introduced them. So first of all, let's hear from Sarah. Thank you so much. I'd like to start uh, by talking about, talking about play. And that's because uh, we use this word in so many different ways. And, um, you know, a lot of people ask, me what my definition of play is or they have debates about if such a certain thing really is play and people seem very concerned with how we're using the word and I think that a lot of the questions that we're asking tonight depend on our use of the word and what we mean by play. So I'm going to um, frame this first of all by acknowledging that there are many different forms of play. Some um, some forms of play can lead to uh, children building friendships. Other forms of play may be beneficial for their physical development. And then again, other forms of play could be the types that support cognitive and intellectual development. So my, my area and um, the work that, that I'll focus on most in the remarks that I want to make is in the last one of those, in cognitive development, I'm a specialist in the learning sciences. And so what I think um, 
the learning sciences can bring to the table here is a way of talking about play that is grounded in our understanding of, of learning and our understanding of the cognitive processes that underpin children's uh, emerging um, understanding of math, their early literacy, and other skills like um, their self-regulation. All of these uh, skills, some of which uh, we know are a big part of uh, the national curriculum and others are you know, represented in, in, in more minor ways, but all of these skills uh, depend on the cognitive uh, mechanisms, the psychological mechanisms um, that we as psychologists study. And those, um, those mechanisms, those learning mechanisms, I would say, actually when you understand the science behind those, you start to see that there is a huge amount of overlap with what happens during play. And I won't go into you know, all the ins and outs of the different research studies that have been done here and now, but what I can say about it is that when you have an understanding of learning, especially in the cognitive aspects of learning that I personally am interested in, you have to recognize that learning and play are not two separate things. It's not learning or play. They actually are very much aligned and very much go together. So, so that's why I like to think about developing children's agency through play, because play means that children or, you know, any learner for that matter, uh, it, it means that you're active, that um, what you're doing is meaningful to you. And also frequently it's open-ended. So those characteristics of play are actually extremely important for deep learning. Being active, having meaningful connections with your own life and your pre-existing beliefs and knowledge, and then also a degree of open-endedness and choice. The, um, the way that we see those aspects of learning and play in school, um, is very easy to imagine in an early years setting. Uh, I don't, I probably don't even need to give you examples, but I will. So say a, a bunch of blocks and um, you can build whatever you want with it. And children may enact something that's familiar to them. They may create a, a bridge or a tower or something from a building site that they saw um, near where they live. And so how that looks as we go up through the years is it's a little bit harder to imagine because it's not how we've done things traditionally, but learning still works in a similar way. We don't learn differently just because, you know, I've had my eighth birthday or I've had my 12th birthday. So I would argue that if we took play seriously throughout um, schooling, it would look a lot more like what happens in the early years. It would be, it would mean that learning is active, that it's meaningful, that there are opportunities for open-endedness and that through all of that, we would be able to build um, 21st century skills like problem solving, taking initiative, collaboration, teamwork, uh, communication skills, all of these things which we know um, are really important for adults. <laughs> Um, and, and actually are reflected quite literally in uh, the characteristics of learning for the early years, um, but that maybe we lose sight of a little bit if we don't take play seriously as we go through more formal schooling. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And now we move straight on to Tom. Thank you very much. So. The Early Intervention Foundation, for those of you who don't know us, is a What Works Centre dedicated to ensuring that effective early intervention is available and used to improve the lives of children and young people at risk of poor outcomes. We're sometimes described as a knowledge broker, which I think can be a slightly pretentious phrase, but it's meant to articulate the idea that we sit at the interface between research and policy. So I'm going to try and focus on my role in, in the thoughts that I give on what it might take 
to get play taken more seriously in the school system. My starting point is that the early, in the early years and primary curriculum are relatively narrow in, with a focus on testing literacy and numeracy. So I'm focusing on what might convince key stakeholders that play should be a more prominent feature of the curriculum. And by key stakeholders, I mean those who have a real influence over what is delivered in schools, such as ministers, senior civil servants, Ofsted officials and school leaders. I think in these debates, there's a danger of setting up a false stereotype or almost a Dickensian like character. We've all been children and I assume the vast majority of us have happy memories of play. I doubt even the most sceptical out there believe that play is completely without value. It's more likely the case that they are just not convinced that the value of greater focus on play relative to other things children could be doing whilst in school. And what is often forgotten in these discussions is that internationally there's quite a lot of variation in when children start formal education and this doesn't obviously seem to explain educational outcomes. I should also say that everything I'm about to say is pure conjecture and has no empirical backing. However, it seems to me that testing the effectiveness of different forms of communicating about play is doable. And if you're serious about taking play more seriously, then more research about what works in communicating with sceptics has to be part of the answer. The first idea I have on this is more evidence on the impact of play. Now, that's probably what you, you expect somebody with the job title director of evidence to say. Well, I should emphasise that I think whilst more evidence is necessary, it's not sufficient to bring about substantive change. The type of evidence really matters here. Longitudinal ev evidence demonstrating an association between aspects of early play and later life outcomes, such as education, employment or mental health, is important and valuable work. But we all have our cognitive biases, and those predisposed to thinking of play as unimportant are likely dis to dismiss such evidence as correlation rather than causation in the same way that I might dismiss or seek to undermine evidence making the contrary point. In my view, experimental evidence could make a real difference here. The Holy Grail is evidence that shows mm. an intervention can improve the quantity or quality of children's play. The children, that change is associated with an improvement in other outcomes of interest, such as cognitive, social, emotional or behavioural development. And that these improvements are sustained over the long term and are causally associated with outcomes such as education, success, improved mental health or employability. I, of course, appreciate that what I'm describing is complicated, long term and expensive work. But we have the evaluation capacity and administrative data infrastructure to do this in the UK. And this sort of evidence could, in my view, convince even the most sceptical of the importance of play. My second point here is about emphasising the evolutionary importance of play. I'm borrowing here from a presentation I saw from one of Sarah's former colleagues, Dave Neal, at a parliamentary event. Dave's explanation of how we can be sure play is doing something important in developmental terms is one of the clearest I've seen. As he put it, all children find a way to play, even the most extreme circumstances such as refugee camps or war zones. Lots of animals and all mammals engage in play. And given the huge cost in energy expended and risk of injury, play must have a crucial role in our development. Otherwise, why would natural selection have acted to embed it deeply in our nature? Now, given I've got a background in biology, I might simply be predisposed to liking arguments which evoke evolutionary theory. But this articulation does strike me as hard to dismiss, and so could be a game changer in discussing play with those who think of it as fun but developmentally unimportant. The government is currently running a, a public health campaign on the importance of parent-child interaction in the early years to support speech and language development. And whilst I'm very supportive of this, could we imagine a similar campaign on the importance of play? The final idea I have on, improve, on improving conversations around play is to discuss it as a lifelong activity. How comfortable are we as adults in discussing the ways in which we play? EIF is a fairly serious place filled with well-educated academic types, but I've probably never seen quite as much energy in the organisation as when we held an Easter egg hunt last year. And to be clear, this wasn't an Easter egg hunt for our children, it was the staff only. Terms like adult play have certain yuck factor to them. And whilst many of us might say we play football, video games, board games and so on, how often do we acknowledge that we are doing that because play has an important role in our lives? And for many of us, our hobbies are becoming increasingly competitive rather than fun. Like many middle-aged men, I've got into cycling in recent years and there's an entire industry dedicated to selling me heart rate monitors and power meters to improve my performance. In a completely different field, every, nearly every amateur baker I know is thinking about when they will apply to bake-off. The idea that you might ride a bike or bake a cake because you enjoy it is often absent. 
And I wonder if those who will work in education and child development could do more to change this and celebrate the value that hobbies and play have in our lives rather than treating them as some tasks we must get better at. So in summary, whilst I think more evidence on the role that play has in influencing a range of outcomes is important, I don't think that by itself this will change the minds of those who see it as an activity which should be confined to the early years and discouraged in school so that children can get on with the serious business of furthering their cognitive development. I think that what is needed alongside this is to change the conversation, to recognise that play has deep evolutionary roots, that is one of the principal ways children explore the world and develop competencies, and that play isn't something confined to childhood. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And over to Michael. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> I work from two very broad ways of using the word play that's relevant to this evening. One is the rule bound play that we call gaming or playing games. And let's leave that to one side for the moment. And this other field that sometimes the word is used free play, which I see and have defined for myself as trial and error without fear of failure. That when we are experimenting with the world or with words or with materials or with ourselves in any way at all, the key thing is to be able to be able to try out things without any fear of failure. That's, for me, the crucial element, because as we know, sadly, education has a lot built in that in actual fact brings about a fear of failure. You know, we know that in all the lead ups to tests and everything else, that this is one of the problems. So when we look at this free play, um, also to sort of think of some, uh, do a kind of Roger's thesaurus on it, if you like, is to think it gathers around it a sort of lexical field of words like inventiveness, creativity. So I don't want to be kind of exclusionist or, or purist about the word play, but that we should see that it's, it encompasses a range of ideas that we frequently use. Now, the key thing about this that we have to address is why is it that this free play, let's leave the gaming to one side, why the free play as I've described it is low status in education and possibly in our culture, that the idea of just trial and error without fear of failure, it falls behind some of these other things, behind gaming, behind um, various kinds of quizzes or whatever, um, you know, had mentioned the idea that some or other, you know, if, you, uh, if, you, if you're riding a bike, you can't do it just for fun, it's got to be competitive. So it's as if some or other it's got low status. Now, why is this? Why does play have low status? Well, my view is that it's embedded deep in the Protestant Reformation that at this point, our culture, particularly in Northern Europe, was beset, taken over, if you like, by an idea that if you were frivolous and if you just played in an open-ended way, that, as it said, idle hands make mischief, that what happened was the devil got in. You can look at the writings, lovely writings, some of them, as it happens of the early Puritans. You take somebody like John Bunyan, who wrote a lovely poem about a boy chasing a butterfly please look it up. And it's a lovely description of a boy chasing a butterfly, but of course it has a little moral to it. And he says, well, this is exactly what's the problem that people do this because they're being misled. They're being misled by, and the implication always is the devil. And that man, human beings are, have fallen as a result of this. So it's quite interesting that this kind of play has this low status, leap forward hundreds of years, and we find a government minister talking about nursery children and talked about something called aimless play. The children are behaving aimlessly. So there's a sense that came from a few years. I won't name the minister. All right. And when she was talking about that, you know, we've all watched nursery children. And if you sit there, watched our own or other people's. And when we observe it, you know, if you just take a cursory glance, you may indeed think it's aimless. But if you think that what they're doing is trial and error without fear of failure. And they're using that experimentation, another part of the lexical field there, the idea of experimenting with the words, the songs, their bodies in the way they dance, or maybe with materials, sand and water is famous, but of course it might be sliding, might be all sorts of ways of exploring the environment. And, and this importance is quite often negated, if you, if you like, as aimless or worthless. But we, I think when we're sticking up for this play, we should remind ourselves that some of the greatest discoveries in science and art, the arts across, at their root, they have play. 
So the reason why we're able to communicate with each other tonight is largely because of the invention of electricity. It had to be discovered, or the discovery of electricity, it had to be discovered that electricity could pass between inanimate materials. The person who discovered it, he has a famous name, Volta. That's why we have volts. And he discovered it by playing, yes, playing with bits of metal in his mouth and setting up a charge that then uh, tingled in his mouth between two different kinds of metal. So at the very heart of this great thing that we have, and we have Michael Faraday who played with copper coins and salt water uh, in the back of the shop where he was working. And again, if you take Shakespeare, you know, it doesn't come higher up than that. If you take a play like Twelfth Night, appropriate this time of year, what did he play with? One of the key things he played with is this great Italian art form, Commedia dell'arte. And so the characters of Malvolio, uh, Andrew Aguecheek, um, and Feste and Maria, these are the stereotypes that come from the popular theatre form of Commedia dell'arte. And Shakespeare played with it in order to tell a story that he wanted to about clashes and values and, um, and if you like, a new order that was coming along in the form of Viola and the middle classes, but he used Commedia in a playful way. Finish with Harry Potter, if you like, something more, maybe more uh, open to everybody that we all know about, Harry Potter. What did she do? She played with genres. She took the genre of the school story, married it to the fantasy story. She put the two together and created a brand new form, but that involves play. When you sit there and write and you hold things in your head, oh, the school story, you might say, or oh, Yes, I know. There's also the fantasy story, you know, the kind of Tolkien thing. So if you like, she's married Tolkien with Billy Bunter to create something brand new. And that's what play can do, because what it does when you trial and error without fear of failure, and I use the word experiment, invent and creativity, is you discover possibilities. You discover the possibilities of yourself. You discover the possibilities of change, that the world is changeable. I am changeable. So instead of receiving the world as is, which in a way is the message of curriculum, please receive this world, we're saying through play, you can change things. You can discover the possibility of change. So it's a very enabling and empowering thing. And just precisely the opposite of this word aimless, which, uh, if you like, horrifies me. Thank you, Michael. And last but not least, uh, Shanina, please. We know play um, is an innate part of who we are as human beings. Um, it defines us. We all play. Um, it's how we learn about the world around us. Um, you know, it's how uh, toddlers learn that their parents' phones are not edible, but do make flashing lights and sounds and potentially quite very interesting objects. Um, we play for the sake of it, and, and my colleagues on the panel have already mentioned this. You know, we, we play for various reasons, and um, we play just because it's fun. It's a fun thing to do, but we're also driven by natural human curiosity. And it's in seeking these answers that we will explore, we'll experiment, we'll tinker, essentially we'll play, and through that play, we will learn. I believe the thing is we never actually stop learning through play throughout our lives. We just stop teaching through play. Uh, uh, and that's the essence there. If we look at early years foundation teachers, they do play-based learning really, really well. Um, as do primary school teachers, they use fun and games to teach everything from colors to early numeracy and literacy, as well as science concepts and so much more. Um, but it does gradually seem to stop in preparation for secondary school. In fact, I think there's a lot of research that I've that sort of looked at significantly seems to focus around uh, using play-based learning and is centered around early years and primary, which I think is quite telling in itself, really. Because when you get to secondary, the, the two are quite distinctly separate. You know, play is for the playground and serious learning is for the classroom and the two do not combine together. They are not one and the same and they don't belong together. But why do we make that distinction? Why are we choosing to continue to separate them? I think we can make a powerful difference if we choose not to limit play to the playground, but to bring essence of it into the classroom and to capitalize it and use it as educators. I mean, think about it. Think of those children in classrooms who know things light years almost ahead of what's on the school curriculum. I, mean, I remember when I was in the classroom, you know, teaching, introducing HTML coding to year 10 students. There was always a student or two that actually already didn't just know HTML, but they were creating high-end professional solutions for paid clients, 
what on earth was I going to teach them about HTML? You know, and I have yet to meet a teenager that has made a conscious decision saying five hours of school plus a couple of hours of homework is just not enough education for me. I need to go and learn some more. That, that's not how they learned it. They got curious. They found something that they really enjoyed doing. And so they did more of it. And through doing that, they wanted to get better at it. They invested time in it and they developed their skills. It's this mastery of skills that you develop through play. And we can see that in other forms of play. You know, we can think about when you're joining and be it sport, if you're learning how to play rugby or um, you're learning how to play chess, you spend time in it. And as you do more and more of it, you, you get better at it. My own daughters saw the friends playing saw friends playing chess and now spend at several hours every weekend practicing their skills um, and getting better and better at chess playing. So that one in the hope that before the end of the year, they'll be able to go back and beat the very friends that inspired them to take this up in the first place. It's about lifelong learning. It, it's, it's, it discontinues um, throughout and we can sort of see translations and aspects of that throughout our lives as adults. And, you know, the way we play changes over the course of our lives. And we know, you know, if we look at the world around us, it, it is transforming all around us. We talk about the impact of technology all the time. Um, it's no longer possible to predict the jobs of tomorrow and the skills that will be needed for those jobs. You know, we need our children to be able to continue to adapt and develop their skills as they go through life. Uh, we need them to be creative thinkers and we need them to be problem solvers. We need them to enjoy learning so that they can continue to choose to develop those skills. Otherwise, they're going to be potentially, you might argue, hard pushed to be, continue to be remain successful in an ever changing environment. And play can help us develop all of these cognitive elements. They can really help us do that. By making education and learning more fun, children are more likely to continue with it. Think about it. It's a very simple concept, really. If a child enjoys what they're doing, they're going to want to do more of it and continue with it. And if not, they'll drop it the first chance they get. I'm sure we've all seen examples of that. I myself, I think of, you know, some of my subjects, I dropped them like a lead balloon the moment I finished using my GCSEs because I just wasn't interested in doing them more. And there's data out there, uh, and actually recent DFE data out there, that looks at enjoyment as a factor for GCSE options. And, and computer science hasn't fared too well in that, unfortunately. In terms of classroom practice and translating that, I've been practicing that for sort of several years and looking through my own teaching, but then also through uh, the Digital Schoolhouse Initiative, we've explored and used playful pedagogical approaches to teach computer science concepts. Things like using role playing games to introducing networking or a user game of Snap to teach computational thinking skills and games design or magic tricks and Play-Doh and dancing and Lego bricks. All of these can be used to teach programming constructs and other key computer science concepts. And I'm sure those could be translated to other subjects, too. And yes, video games are a part of that. They are the 21st century embodiment of play. They tied back into our human instincts that are centered around play. And it, it's perhaps one of the reasons why they seem to cross all diversity categories. Research shows 99% of eight to 15 year olds play video games. And you ask a class of kids who wants to play a game and almost every hand will shoot up immediately. You ask them who wants to make a game and you get a similar response. Games have elements of skill, logical thinking, problem solving. These are essential skills that we need them to learn. And educators, can really help provide a framework and a structure in the classroom that captures these elements and brings them to the forefront of children's minds to help them realize what they're learning and to make the most of it. And video games themselves are a unique fusion of and a blend of science and maths and storytelling and art and computer science. And you can use them to develop so many different skills. And so to end with, I just wanna say, if we as educators are not using games and play more broadly to our advantage, then I think we are sorely missing a trick. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all of you for those uh, opening comments. We've got questions coming in from the audience, which is fantastic. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna invite the panelists to comment on the first question I've chosen, um, which is by Lily, and it's to do with how how you think children's play impacts on children's well-being but it, I just want to say a few things in response because it's certainly you've really excited me and, and, I, and I, my mind's buzzing one of the first things I want to say that overall is, is the, the fascinating different disciplinary influences that have already come to the fore so 
the arts have been mentioned, including with creativity, the social sciences, the natural sciences and the ideas of, of inventions coming about through serendipity and play uh, and trying things out. Maybe we would say that agency and children's agency could be seen as a sociological perspective. And of course, all of these things are helping us in the discipline of education. Uh, turning to just a few points from what individuals have said, the, the idea that children have agency, I think is of growing interest to us all. Um, and then uh, how, how are we going to prove in inverted commas um, that, that play is even more beneficial than people already think? Are experimental trials, for example, the, the most robust evidence to, to give us the, what we need? Um, the idea of free play and the, the, the way that language is used sometimes to denigrate all sorts of things, including play, and sometimes to celebrate it. And then finally, the importance of curiosity and experimentation. Anyway, uh, I'm going to come back then to children's well being, uh, one of our audience questions. Could I invite one of the panelists if we could indicate that they might like to say something on well-being? I'd be grateful. Brilliant. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'll just say this. Um, I'm not a practitioner in the sense of being a, a therapist or a psychotherapist or something like that. But we have this word depression, and it's a very interesting word apart from the tragedy it is if people experience depression, because in it is the sense that you're being pressed down, it has this idea, we could talk about depressing a button. So if you experience depression as, a, as the opposite of well-being, almost in a sense of a feeling bad, feeling bad about yourself and so on, is that you're being pressed down and you can feel pressed down by other people or just by an anonymous world. We have the word anomie as well, meaning that sense of just again almost the opposite of well-being what we're all saying about play that is important you've mentioned agency um, and I mentioned the idea of it's full of possibilities of change if you have a view of yourself that you can change nothing this is a depressing thing because you have a sense that the world is bigger than you and you cannot you cannot do anything to change anything and I think our argument for all of us is that one of the powerful things about play even if it's just pushing a little thing across a table. I watched my children playing with bits of grass and they invented a game. In fact, it was a kind of sedge with a little bobble on the top and they invented a game, whacking it and who could get the top off it. And there were no scores, it was just the fun of it, but they discovered you could use the immediate environment, very important with free play, use the immediate environment, change it so you could fill your time with it in a fun way. As it happens, our car had broken down and so they found a way instead of me getting ratty, they were having fun. They learned that the world is something that you have agency to change. So I th in a way, it is the opposite of being depressed by the world. Instead, you engage with it, change it, and discover that you have that capability yourself. So that's what I'd say as a, as a general point. Thanks very much, Michael. Would anyone else like to uh, say anything about this? The idea of well-being, right, well, I. I think, Sarah, you just had your hand up and, and then we'll go to Shanila. Thank you. I'm thinking about the possibilities of learning through play um, that mean children's experiences don't all have to be carbon copies of each other because, of course, children are all so different one from another. And, I mean, there are some children who have very specific um you know, special educational needs, but every child really has special needs, don't they? So that, so when you adopt an approach that is open-ended and does allow for some freedom and some flexibility in acknowledging those individual differences inherent in the learning approach, that necessarily is going to give children a better experience of learning. They're not going to be forced to fit into a mold. Yes, absolutely. Shanila and then Tom, I think you had the underpass as well, possibly. Yeah, um, I think there's, there's lots of sort of different elements here. And I, and I think one of the things uh, sort of around sort of play and well-being and, and uh, what it can do is really give children that kind of boost in confidence. Um, 
and that boosting confidence around being creative, uh, which which is so important. And I think if we look at creativity, sometimes I think in school, well, in secondary school, um, largely, I think when you talk about creative, you talk about creative subjects, you talk about art and drama and, and, and dance. Uh, and actually, um, you know, every subject can be creative because creativity is, the, you know, is the ability to come up with new ideas. They don't have to be new to the world, just new to you. And play can really help bring that out in students. Um, you know, this idea that, you, you know, you, you're providing them with that framework and they're generating those new ideas and they're able to take ownership over it. Um, that sort of tinkering, the fact that if you're using, um, additionally, you're using objects or resources within the classroom that are um, maybe unexpected, but not unfamiliar to them. I, I'm sorry, I keep going back to computer science because obviously that's my field. But, you know, like if, if I'm introducing kids to programming and I, I the first thing I do is show them a um, an ID, so a, a, like a programming environment screen straight away and they've never seen it before. It can be quite intimidating and it plays to your stereotypes. But actually, if what I get out first is a lump of Play-Doh, then I've never seen a child that's frightened of Play-Doh. Um, there probably are children out there, but I've just not seen them. Um, and But what it's very tactile and it invites uh, you to sort of manipulate it and take part, et cetera. And you can use that. And once you show children that actually... You, you go you can go through an activity and you've used that play-doh to teach them programming what it does it raises their confidence and it raises their confidence and this understanding and this self-belief that i can do this and i had a great time while i was doing this as well this is fun so it goes back to that idea i i, I sort of want to do more there's also lots of other stuff around um uh mental health and, and self-esteem and, and things like that when you're playing games as well but i, I won't go into that because then i'll just capitalize on the time <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Tom. I, think, I mean, it's, mm. it's not just in teaching children computer programming. A large part of my genetics degree, we had to we spend playing with Play-Doh, but that, that, that's <laughs> an aside. I mean, I think it's a really interesting question. I mean, one of the things, are, I think well-being can be a, a slightly nebulous concept sometimes, but you know, one way you might ident you sort of define it is that people have who have good well-being feel some sort of agency or control over their destiny. So I think one of the things that play can do for children is give them the time and space to pursue their own interests rather than those of which adults impose upon them. So I think you know, that clearly play has a, has a role there. I'd also say you might, you might define good well-being as the absence of, of mental health challenges or problems. And we know, we know that a good, a good number of these social emotional skills, which are predictive of, protecting against mental health problems things like self-efficacy and resilience can be built but through play through a built by through the competencies that people that children learn through play so i think that they're the sort of couple of the ways that i think that play really is linked to well-being Brilliant. thank thank you all very much um and just uh, for information on friday there's an event all about uh, well-being for children and young people um, it's a british educational research association event but it's being led by one of our ioe colleagues uh, professor jane hurry so for those interested in that particular topic please do join us um, i'm going to move on to another question um, and this one is from sarah it, it says what is the potential for using the concept of playfulness to improve the quality of learning in the context of more formal classroom learning. And I suspect perhaps the tensions around, for example, as children get older, the idea that play is no longer relevant might be in this, um, but I, please do interpret the question as you wish. Have I got someone to kick off? Brilliant, thanks, Michael. Uh, happy to illustrate this with a couple of things, Take you back 60 years to my biology lessons doing O-level biology in a grammar school in North London. And we were doing, of course, photosynthesis. And our teacher told us to experiment with a bit of this, that uh, about the notion that uh, plants in the dark don't have, will stop producing chlorophyll and that you can see this in the leaves. So you can do this on pelagonium leaves. And she gave us a little strip to put on the, the leaf and we put it in the dark. And sure enough, it showed that. And I can remember that very clearly. Um, but then somebody suggested, not me, well, if that works, in those days we used to do photography, black and white photography with negatives. And this person, I forgot whether it was a boy or a girl, said, if you put a negative on the fill, on the, on the leaf, could you have, could you actually then actually put a portrait of yourself onto a leaf? And Miss Pope said, I've no idea. 
let's find out. That wonderful creative thing that teachers can do is to say, I don't know, even when they do. So she said, I don't know, let's look. So sure enough, we put, all put, brought in portraits of ourselves, bung them on the leaf, on well, negatives they were, and put them in the cupboard. And a week later, we took it out and we all had portraits of ourselves on these pelagonium, commonly called ger geranium, geranium leaves. And just the speed with which she responded that here was an interesting thing to do. And indeed, we people have talked about agency and control and the fun of it and the idea that the world is changeable all became apparent in that single moment. And the other example I'll give is that if you're teaching poetry in schools, as I do, if you teach poetry, you can tell children how poetry works. You can give them a little lecture and you can say there's this technique and that technique. And I've decided to invert that completely and say, what if every child is a poem detective and their job is to find the secret strings in a poem? And it can be a secret strings with sound. It can be a secret string with image or a secret string with feeling. And it maybe talk a little bit longer and then away they go in little groups. They put poems on the floor. They've got felt tips and anything that they think is a string. They put a loop round, loop around the two aspects of it and write on the piece of paper somewhere. Uh, what they think the secret string is. And I've found that that as a way of playing with poetry, of reversing the whole notion that literary criticism is something that only belongs to very experienced professors um, and that somehow or other you as a reader, you won't know how to do it. I've found a way of reversing it so that it's play. And then you have the means and the apparatus to have actually looked at how poetry works. And quite often you've been inventive and you've invented ways of doing it and discovered things. We haven't mentioned discovery, uh, discovered things even as you're playing. And um, I found that to be sort of two examples of for older school students, ways in which you can incorporate play into learning. Absolutely. And a, a link with the natural sciences again. Would someone else like to talk on this, this idea of, uh, yes, please, uh, Janila, off you go. Yeah, so... Um... It's, I guess, I guess, what the, the, you know, the example that I guess uh, springs to mind is sort of many years ago, I, I took a year off for maternity and came back into teaching, um, spent the rest of that academic year feeling a bit shell-shocked, to be honest. Um, but one of the things um, that happened was, so I, I came back and I was teaching, there's this uh, bright group of kind of year, year eight, and we were, we were doing games design. Um, and I used to, at that time, use games design as a way to try and squeeze um, computing and programming into key stage three IT curriculum, which at the time was uh, Microsoft Office branded ambassadors. Um, but what happened was um, I, I'd approached the class and it was at that moment, and I used to teach very traditionally sort of way back then. And so in the sense that a typical IT lesson used to start with, and in many cases, I think sometimes still does, with a teacher standing at the front of the class saying, this is what we're gonna learn today be quiet, listen to me, here's a demonstration, now go do it. And if you get stuck, here's a worksheet to help you out. Um, the problem was, as I saw the class, as I, as I approached the classroom, I realized I'd actually totally forgotten how to do this particular skill. And I think it was how to um, reduce lives if you, if you got, if, a, if an enemy sort of collided with you type, type thing. And I was completely stumped. Uh, so I thought, what on earth am I going to do? And actually, um, it was this moment where I thought, I've got a brilliant idea. Um, so I went to the board and rather than do the demo, I said, we're going to do things a bit differently today, folks. And I set challenges and I set all of those things as challenges. Um, you know, and I said to the kids, right, you know, we've got these, we've got four different sources of help that you can go and look at. Let's see what we can come up with. By the end of that lesson, the students had discovered three different ways to get characters to lose lives. They'd also discovered a whole host of additional things. I'd actually learned a lot, all that and more. But I went and then took this model and explored it with different types of students, different ages um, and students, for example, where uh, classroom management and behavior management was, was the real effort, you know, there was that, that type of character of kids. And the results were astonishing because in each case, even if you had a student 
that um, was unable to meet the challenge. Everybody tried to get there. And in doing so, they learned something. They discovered something new. And in a classroom environment, sometimes it created this unique situation, which can be sometimes hard to replicate otherwise, where you've got students. There's always that the, a group of students that, as a teacher, might you might class as the lowest ability in that, in that group. And they're the ones that you might pair with the higher ability kids, and, and they receive all sorts of support. And they might not have met that challenge, but in discovering something else, they found something that in the kids lingo was actually really super cool. And, um, and the, the person next to them got really interested. Everyone else got interested. And next thing you know, that the brainiest kid in the class gets super excited, comes over to this child, sits down and uh, says to them, can you please teach me how to do that? Because that's so cool and I want that in my game. The miracle that did on their self-esteem was astonishing. And then that, that finding has been replicated at, numerous times since then. Thanks so much. Now, I'm, I've got two questions that are, seem to me to be related to policy, and, and particularly, I suspect, policy in England in terms of uh, how some people feel policy in terms of curriculum is being driven by assessment outcomes and so on. So I'll, I'll, I'll turn to you for comments on, on that sort of area in a moment. But before that, I've got the results of the polls that were done. So the first uh, outcome, it was this question, what proportion of reception pupils, uh, class time, not break times, should be spent on unstructured play? And the, the highest result um, was 64%, and then the outcome, that was the 75% uh, percentage. Uh, and then after that, the 50%, percentage and then going down. Uh, the second question, what about play, i.e. free choice activities during year three, about the age seven to eight class time? The result for that, um, just um, the 50 percent allocation was the favoured result there, and then the 25 percent allocation. A lot of percentages in, in the questions and answers here. Um, and the final question was, and what about in year six, the age 10 to 11 class time? Uh, and here, perhaps predictably for some people, um, a quarter, 25% allocation was deemed to be the most appropriate by the time uh, children reach year six. Interesting results there. And thank you all in the audience for um, giving your votes and so on and your opinions. So now let's come back to the policy questions. Uh, so we had um, Teresa ask this. She said, perhaps an integral part of play is the lack of a predetermined or indeed any outcome. How do teachers prioritize play when under, under pressure for outcomes? Uh, and, a, and a linked question, uh, Harry, said policymakers are largely driven by attainment outcome data. How do we conduct research that justifies the importance of play to them? Can we use RCTs at all? So uh, would anyone like to start us off on the, these questions around policy and whether play is supported or not? And who'd like to go first? <laughs> Don't mind having another go. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, Sarah was just, just in there. Thank you, Michael. Perhaps comes next. OK, so I come face to face with the curriculum and policy in the field of writing. It's, it's obviously I come into schools or I've been doing it recently virtually. Now, there are all sorts of lists of what it is that writing should be in the primary school. There are these expected levels. There are these things that are supposed to be included in what is counted as a good piece of writing. And these are such things as expanded noun phrases, um, the right number of relative clauses, and the famous fronted adverbial. Now, for somebody who's a writer, this seems quite, quite absurd, because we never start from structures that are given, and we don't think necessarily that's the right way to learn how to write, or even in, in any way at all. We might discover what those things are, we might even learn what they are, but not as a means of evaluating what is good writing. And we know the reason for it, is because it's policy. It's policy because it's come as a result of what used to be called the SPAG test and is now called GPS, suspended for this year, I understand. Um, 
uh, and, and part of SATS, which is a way of evaluating teachers. So policy is leading here how children should write. So if I'm in front of a class, as I was today, and it comes up as to how might we begin a story, I don't think that what we tell children is there is this way to begin a story. What I think we do is we suggest that children play. And the way they can play is to take four, five, 20 books off the shelf and say, how are these stories? How did they begin? How did Michael Morpurgo, how did Anne Fine, how did Mal Mallory Blackman introduce and begin a story? And then you can imitate it or play with it. Imitate, invent. It's one of the great ways in which all the arts work through imitation and invention. It is a form of play. So you can look and see the opening of a book. You might, if you're older, with older students, you might say, well, how did Shakespeare begin plays? Do you know how Hamlet begins? It begins with one of the greatest openings of all time. I think it begins, or maybe I'm not absolutely right here, but something like this. Who goes there? Wow, what a way to open a film, a play, a story. Somebody says, who's there? What's, what's going on? And suddenly you're drawn in. When we play with stuff and realize that language and writing is malleable and playable with, and that's what should be one of our messages for children, then this stuff about what is policy, it can recede. And we can actually, instead of having to be the passive receivers of policy, we could say, well, if we play, we may actually arrive at the same point, great inventive ways of beginning stories, but we've got to it through play. Yeah. I'll bring you in, Sarah, just in a moment. And Michael's comments about writing, it's an area I'm fascinated by as well, um, and it's part of my research. And I think for me, one of the things is the, the endless promise to actually create, compose, invent, never arise, almost never arise, because that again takes us back to trial and error. And you, there's no way that you can freely compose and create without making mistakes. That's the whole point. I would link that also with the idea that, of course, until some words are down on paper, it's very difficult for, well, impossible for others, peers, teachers, parents to help, because without the words, we can't help with the writing. Sarah, over to you. I think that I would phrase the question a little bit differently. And that's because the way I understood the question to me seemed to imply underneath it that this idea that I mentioned earlier, that play and learning are two separate things. And that if you want to learn something, that's fine. If you want to play, that's fine, but you can't do both. And coming back to what I said earlier, I don't believe that that's what the research tells us. I think actually um, we can have outcomes and play. Uh, and, and so, so that's, that's the first thing um, that I would say when children are, or any learners uh, are motivated when they're engaged and when they want to continue doing what they're doing, they're more likely to learn something and to, to build on that and to keep going. And that can lead to lifelong learning. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I, I think that this brings us to a point I, I don't believe we meant we've mentioned yet, which is the one about mindsets. And we've talked a lot about uh, children's play. We haven't talked very much about teachers play. And a lot of what we're discussing here relies on teachers being comfortable themselves with open endedness and with you know, actively making decisions in the moment, all of the things that they have to do in reception, that, that you know, planning in the moment concept, which isn't as familiar to teachers, um, you know, as the years go up. But it's not just that they maybe don't, um, you know, practice that as much. There also aren't a lot of enablers for teachers. They're expected, you know, to, to do certain things at certain times in a lot of schools. So, so I think that we need to be conscious of all of that too, that there's, there's questions, this maybe starts inching more towards your policy questions, but there are questions there around what are the mindsets of the teachers, but also what are the policies at school level and so on and so forth that can enable all of this. Mm, absolutely. Tom, would you like to come in? Yeah, um, so, so to Teresa's question, to, to start with a sort of the idea of lack of predetermined outcomes and, and the potential role that has in a, a system that's quite focused on accountability and, and attainment. I mean, I, I do think it, you know, it requires a certain amount of braveness on, on the, the part of teachers and educators to, to 
to use more play-based approaches. But I yeah, agree with Sarah as well. I don't think there is a distinction here. Or I think we can set, set up a false distinction between either, either we've got sort of play-based or progressive curricula or we've got knowledge-rich curricula. I just, I just don't think that's a very, a very helpful distinction, particularly in, in primary schools. I think what's important is that teachers have a range of of methods of imparting knowledge and skills to people and you know and, and flex those because there'll be heterogeneity within the children as well and who responds well to different approaches but the yeah when more play-based approaches are used that they have an aim they don't have to have a predetermined outcome but i think it is important that children understand why they're doing something and what uh, and, and what they're learning through that um and I, but i do i genuinely believe there is a role for, for more of that within within the curriculum and to the to the second question around policy makers being attainment driven you know i'm, I'm a former civil servant i've worked in the department of education that, that, that is absolutely the case you'd expect me to say this but i do think randomised control trials do have a role to play in, in in providing evidence to this this debate. You know, I'm not an RCT evangelist, but I do believe they are one of the best methods we have for attributing causality. So I think, and they are, and I'm, I know from personal experience as a civil servant, one of the forms of evidence ministers and senior civil servants are most likely to engage with. So RCT evidence on how the quantity or changing the quantity or quality of play or the type of play can be associated with an improvement in other outcomes you know, definitely will carry weight with stakeholders here and i think that's something that we need to to really think about and invest in thank tom and i think you know that observation about um how civil servants and ministers respond to particular kinds of methodologies is really interesting it's also an area of intense debate and has been for decades, arguably. Um, but it, it, I think, I think, I mean, from my point of view, I'm think, thinking about, for example, the evidence on the teaching of reading and young children, something I know about. Um, well, there's 30 years plus of evidence. Um, there are not only randomized control trials, but there are also now systematic reviews and even tertiary reviews. And yet it's still a finely balanced argument, for example, between uh, the extent to which certain kinds of phonics appro approaches are beneficial or not. So while I absolutely agree about the merits of randomized controlled trials, I also would want to say one trial is not going to solve it. And, it, it, you know, and often I'm afraid the quality of the trials that we have are not strong enough um, in lots of different areas. And that's not that's no particular criticism of the researchers. It's just so hard to do, as you know, RCTs in a social context. Um, anyway, um, time is uh, moving on. I have uh, another question here that perhaps takes us into a more theoretical and rather interesting different territory. Um, this is from Kenneth. Do any of the panelists have thoughts on the notion of embodied knowledge? I ask this as an ex-dancer who worked creatively with children and movement. You might want a little moment to ponder, but I, I thought that was a lovely question. Um, it certainly got me thinking. It took me straight back to learning to play the violin as a child. And, you know, obviously those kind of physical things are very much embodied, as is dance. But, and then I'm beginning to think, well, does embodiment creep into things that we regard as more abstract? Would anyone uh, like to venture in? Yes, uh, that's Shanila, thanks. Hi, um, I'm not sure if this is gonna completely answer the question, but I just, I guess sort of, I'll, I'll try my best. Um, I just sort of, it sort of takes me back. I, I guess one of the things that we do is um, we use uh, dance to, teach programming um and on the surface of it do i just like worlds apart but it works so beautifully because dance uh choreographed dance sequences are, are sort of very clearly uh you know that there, there's there's a routine right and they can be quite strict and you can follow it through and we get kids to um for example have a look at a dance routine and they'll dissect it and the, the moment you can put something with arrows next to it or, or step by step sequence etc you've got an algorithm there mm. and they'll put it into a flow chart but we actually 
you know, um, to try and avoid sort of technical terminology around computer science, but you can actually introduce some very high end computer programming co principles simply through the medium of uh, dance. And we teach this to year four, year five, it's been taught to year three. And the beauty of it is, is that it works just as well with A-levels and forget A-level students. I've taught it to um, grown-ups, teachers and people in industry. Um, mm. So th I think that's the beauty of it. It's, it's that you're teaching quite high-end abstract technical concepts, but you're able to bring it all the way down to a very young audience to, to, uh, to grown-ups. I'm sorry yeah. if that's not answered the question properly, but... No, I think that's really helpful. And it reminds me of, you know, Michael has mentioned Shakespeare and plays a lot. And uh, of course, plays embody many things uh, through the language and through the actions of the actors. So, um, but certainly to hear that com computer programming can be embodied in that way is absolutely fascinating. And unfortunately, um, we've we've reached the end of the session today. I mean, all that remains for me to do is I really want to thank the speakers immensely and the audience who um, have you know the questions have been lively and, and have kept us engaged. And I'm sorry that I can't see all the audience, um, but I guess we're all looking forward to that time when we can um, get in the same room together and chew the cud, as it were. Anyway, uh, thanks everyone and I look forward to seeing you again at another event and good night.